This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and today is our guest for a career shoot interview. We have former WWE and WCW star Johnny B. Bad, a.k.a. Mark Marrow. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing awesome, man. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm, I'm missing the gym with this lockdown. I bet you probably are, too, but I imagine you probably have some equipment at your house. Well, you know, I, it's so funny. Um, a couple weeks before this thing happened, I sold all the equipment. I, I have a beautiful home gym, but I sold it all because I have a personal trainer that I would go to him and he, I'd have these amazing workouts. I could never work out like I could if I was with a personal trainer. So I ended up selling all my equipment. <laughs> and we had this, this pandemic hit us. And I'm using it like, uh, you know, those, those big water jugs that you buy at the store? I'm using yeah. those for like walking lunges and, and shoulder raises and stuff, but just to do something to to stay busy. But I've been, you know, the main thing is eating eating properly while you're while you can't, you know, work out like you, you could at the gym. Yeah, you were always known for having one of the best physiques. You always had your abs in. You always had the tan. Um, what were some of the keys to to keeping so trim, even right up until the end of your WWE run? You always had your abs in. Well, you know, uh, a lot of the guys I traveled with uh, back in the day, you know, when I was with WCW, we trained with uh, uh, travel with DDP or, or Buff Bagwell or, or you know, guys that always, uh, Alex Wright, always wanted to go to the gym. So, you know, it's part of our daily thing of going to the gym on the road because obviously being on the road, it's, it's hard to stay in the kind of shape you can if you're at home all the time with proper sleep and everything. But, uh, but, but traveling with guys that always wanted to work out also, we'd push each other. So that made it a lot easier. And, and uh, DDP and I are probably the two most competitive people you've ever met. So when I came up with like these crazy ab workouts that <laughs> we almost kill each other, he would try to keep up with me on everything we would do. And then, you know, sometimes he'd do more and it'd be like, I'd have to compete with him. And even to this age now, I mean, Dallas is going to be, I think Dallas just turned 63. Um, and I'm going to be 60 in uh, two months. Uh, we do these 10 second push ups. And, um, you know, I've always wanted to beat him. I finally got to the point where I could beat Dallas. So anyways, when I go to, when I go to Atlanta, I always stay with DDP and we have these push-up contests where I finally beat him. And I was like, yes, that son of a gun got crazy and started just practicing and practicing. And I came back in a, a couple, couple months later. And the first thing he says to me goes, bro, Let's go downstairs and do our, our push-up contest. And he's got it filming it and everything, you know. That son of a bitch got me back and beat me again. So now he's holding the title of our 10-second push-up. But I'll get him back. What's the record in 10 seconds? He's up to, I believe he's doing 13 now, which is crazy. Now, when, it, when we call it 10-second push-ups, but they're really they're 30-second push-ups because it's, it's 10 seconds up, you know, 10 seconds down and hold it for 10 seconds. So it's 30 seconds to, for one push up, but we just call it 10 second push ups. And you mentioned Buff Bagwell. I did an interview with him a couple weeks ago. He doesn't seem like he's doing the best these days. Have you been in touch with him at all recently? Yeah, you know, like all of us, we all go through struggles in life, man. You know, there's a, there's a valleys and the mountains in life, you know, and you're, you're, you know, he, he may be going through a valley right now, but he'll come back. You know, he, he, he always does. And, and um, you know, um, as, as a friend, you just pull for him. You know, you, I, I just don't believe in, in beating a guy when he's down, you know, but he'll be OK. Now, what I have in my house for training, I don't have any weights, but I do have a heavy bag. I do a little bit of boxing, but I know you started off in sports as an amateur boxer do you have any uh, favorite combination drills you can show? <laughs> you know, it's always good to start everything off with a jab. You know that, okay? Uh, I always like that jab, right, uh, straight right, hook to the body, right, and then a, and a high left hook. So it kind of mixes it up a little bit. Now, I heard uh, in some other interviews that you've done, you were a street fighter before you got into boxing. Was that just because you were an angry kid picking on people or almost picking fights? Or did people choose to mess with you for various reasons? I don't know where that story actually came from. I just got the crap beat out of me a lot, okay? <laughs> no. When, when, um, 
my parents were divorced and we moved to the west side of Buffalo, New York, which was a really bad neighborhood. And this is back in the late 60s. There was a race riots going on all over the country. It was really bad. You know, the, the death of the assassination of Martin Luther King and a lot of terrible things were happening. And school was so scary because we were the, I was the minority in our school that we went to. And man, I was getting in a lot of fights and stuff. But it was really tough. It was a scary time in my life. Just a little kid, too, you know. So you learn how to defend yourself. You learn how to fight back. And, and you get to the point in your life where you don't take crap from anybody. And, you know, you got into, I got into a lot of scuffles, you know. But I wouldn't consider myself a street fighter. But it was really boxing that really calm me down actually you know when I when I got into boxing amateur boxing I I really became dedicated to that sport where I was constantly you know eating properly training really hard and um, you know staying away from any kinds of alcohol or anything like that at that time what weight class were you I fought light heavyweight which is for amateurs 178 okay and your biggest accomplishments in boxing I understand you were golden gloves at one point yeah, I won the uh, the gold medal in the Empire State Games, which is a state title in New York. Then I won the New York State Golden Gloves um, uh, twice. I, well, I had a total of four state titles in New York. And then um, I became a member of the USA boxing team in 1981. And I understand you had an injury that stopped you from going pro. And that injury during your off time, that led you down kind of the wrong path, getting into cocaine and cocaine dealing i guess that was the trajectory that changed my life back then you know um my for many years i trained so hard i never took there was no no off season in boxing you know we'd train all year long and we'd have tournaments and you'd even fight in the summer because that's when the uh, it was called the empire state games uh, in new york so you always train for that and when I, I decided to come home from the U.S. boxing team and turn professional because I was at top, I realized I was at the, when I was with the U.S. boxing team, I realized I was one of the best fighters in the country. So I decided to turn professional in boxing. Two weeks before my first professional boxing match, I had my nose shattered in an accident and I needed reconstructive surgery. And in that time off is, you know, when I, when I remember just thinking, you know, I'm going to come back in a year and I'm going to eventually become champ of the world, you know. And that time off was the first time in, that I could ever remember where I had all this free time. Because remember, I was always playing football, hockey, and, you know, boxing, always having sports to go to. And, and, and you know, there was, there was always something to look forward to or to train for. Now I had this free time where I couldn't train because it was letting my, my nose heal. And it was that time where I just man, I started to hang out with the wrong kids. And it wasn't, and, and, you know, and I, I could point my finger at whatever, but, you know, it's ultimately my choice to do the things that I did. And I remember thinking, you know what, I'm going to come back and I'm going to be champ of the world. But I started going to parties and I just wanted to have fun. I was like, I always, I didn't drink, I didn't party. And, I, and then all of a sudden I started drinking. I started laughing with my buddies, having fun. Then I got into, you know, smoking and doing other things. Then it's got into cocaine. And cocaine was the drug that just changed my life. And it was like, oh my gosh, I love this drug, you know? And of course, to afford cocaine, you, you, you gotta start, you know, it's just so expensive. I wasn't making any money at that time. So I would start dealing drugs and it got bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden that my nose was healed. I was ready to go back and I was in no shape to go back to boxing. So one year became two years, two years became four years and four years become 10 years of my life of drug addiction. And it was so bad, man. I tell you, it was, it, you know, so many of my friends got busted. So my friends did jail time. Um, I remember they raided my mother's house. They, they did over $10,000 damage in my mom's house and we got rid of everything in time, luckily. But you know, when I think back now, it's like, I remember being arrested myself and thinking, man, this is probably the best thing that ever happened to me. I finally can get my life together again, you know, spend a few years in jail. And then this is when they were searching my mother's house. They had me in a police car. And when they came out and realized there was nothing to be found because we got rid of it all, they let me go. But I went right back to doing the same thing again, you know, and it was like year after year of, of drug addiction. And it was just a spiraling, spiral out of control of my life. And, um, and that's when I ended up uh, working for a pool company and digging swimming pools. I mean, I went from making so much money dealing cocaine to when everybody got busted, I had to go find a job and I was 
building swimming pools. So I moved to Venice, Florida to uh, work with a company called Pacific Pools. And in that time, I'd go to this gym called The Waiting Room. And at the gym, I met some of the guys that were actually guys that were on TV that would, you know, get beat up by the superstars in professional wrestling. We'd you know, call them jobbers or enhancement guys, whatever you want to call them. And I said, well, how do you how do you do this, man? How do you get to be one of those guys? And they go, well, you know, you got to go, go to wrestling school. You got to know how to fall. You gotta, you know. So they told me about a wrestling school in Tampa. It was Boris Malenko, Dean and Joe Malenko's father. So it was about a little over an hour drive. And I started driving there. And I remember Boris Malenko was a no-nonsense guy. And, uh, you know, they, they, I remember they're doing this thing where you would, you know, because wrestling, you know, wrestling's fake, right? So yeah. he'd, like, have you cross your arms and just fall backwards. And I remember landing on my back for the first time. Like, I'm telling you, I sound like a seal from SeaWorld. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even breathe. I'm thinking, how the heck these guys fall like this? But eventually he showed me, taught me. And then I was, after, you know, doing this for a while, I asked those guys that go to, that drove all the way to Atlanta, about a, about a seven or eight hour drive from Venice, Florida. And they would go to center stage and they'd be, hopefully get picked to be one of the guys. They get paid 150 bucks, you know? So I said, can I go with you guys? And sure enough, they, they allowed me to go and, you know, I had a good physique and everything. So they chose me. I was in a tag team match against Doom, remember Ron Simmons and Butch Reed, the world tag team champions of the world. It's my first, match you know and uh and i remember the finish was i think it was i i think it was butch picked me up on his shoulder ron comes off the top rope with a clothesline or reverse or whatever which one did that i can't remember but they clothesline you off their shoulder and pin you one two three and of course there's the commercial break and you know everything that they do so the match went fairly well and then all of a sudden they clotheslined me they pinned me one two three and of course they're doing their thing in the ring and I just roll out thinking it's the end of the match. You know, I don't want to be in their way. I didn't really know that I was supposed to just stay there until they told me to get out of the ring. Well, anyways, um, we went back to the dressing room and the superstars were wrestling. They had their own dressing room. And then the guys that were the enhancement guys or jobbers, myself included, was in the other dressing room. And oftentimes after he wrestled one of the superstars, they would come into the enhancement guys dress room and just shake their hand and say, Hey, thanks a lot. Great job. I appreciate you doing what you did, you know? And it was just like kind of a nice thing to, to do. Well, I go back to my dress room and Ron Simmons, Butch Reed come in and Butch Reed is livid. He's like, mother effer this. Thing. He just went off on me. When we take you down with our finish, you stay down. And it was like the first I heard of this. And I was like, I'm really sorry, man really apologize, you know, and he kept going off on me and off on me. And then a switch just turns to me. It's like, hey man, I said I was sorry, enough, you know? And then it became F you, F you, and next thing you know, we square off and we're ready to fight. I mean, my first day there, I'm gonna fight butchery. And it was, it was um, Sid Vicious who comes in and separates us. And he goes, hey, Butch, this guy's okay. And Sid didn't even know me, but he just goes, hey, this guy's cool, man. He's okay, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he cooled it down, you know. And, and then Butch and Ron left the room, and, and Sid said, hey, kid, you, you did a great job out there. You know, next week I, I'm going to have you wrestle me, or next time we have center stage taping. Sure enough, the next time we come and I wrestle Sid, and <laughs> it's the old where he puts you out on a stretcher and he clotheslines you off the stretcher, and it's, it was horrible, you know. Uh, and it was great. TV, that was what Sid did. There was, there was no one that looked more menacing than Sid Vicious. He had the best look in wrestling back then, you know? Um, Do you think he gets a bad rap? Sometimes people throw him under the bus, but I've met him a bunch of times and worked with him, and he seems like a really nice guy to me. I tell you, I, I can't think of one bad thing I could say about Sid Vicious. I mean, everyone has their issues with people. But I, 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 he was just so nice to me, man. He was just a good guy to me. And, um, you know, and, and part of what he did was really help me get, um, you know, my foot in the door because he, re he asked that I could wrestle him, you know, like he wanted, cause you know, I was in good shape and stuff and he, he looked like he beat a fairly tough guy, you know, on TV. So, um, anyways, well, right after that match, uh, Dusty Rhodes approaches me and says, Hey kid, anybody ever tell you, you look like little Richard. And I, I thought he 
was talking about a wrestler. I didn't think he'd be talking about the, the singer Little Richard. I go, oh, I never heard of him. And he goes, you never heard of Little Richard? You know, wop bop a little bop a wop bop boo? And I go, oh, the singer, yeah, I've heard of him. And he goes, did anybody tell you you look just like him? And I go, no, I never heard that before. He goes, I think I got a gimmick for you. Now, my only my second time, I, it was the second or third time going to driving the center stage. And all of a sudden it was like, I may be one of the guys that goes in the other dressing room, <laughs> you know? And um, I remember that, so Dusty Rhodes calls me to the um, uh, CNN Center. And I was living in Venice, Florida. They wanted me there the next day. So I go out to get my car and they repossess my Zuzu pickup truck. I mean, I was so broke at this time. I got no car to get there. And Mark Hildreth, who eventually became Van Hammer, was a friend of mine. And he would come to Venice, Florida and hang out there. And, and he, he, he drove me to um, Atlanta, where I got to meet with Dusty Rhodes. And that was where I signed my, my first contract. And oh my gosh, it was like my, my life was forever changed. And all because of Dusty Rhodes thinking, I look like little Richard. <laughs> Have you heard about uh, the the stuff that's gone on with Van Hammer recently? Speaking of him, yeah, very sad, very sad. Another another, another tragedy that came out of uh, out of wrestling, but um, not because of wrestling, because of his own choices. But uh, just a no tragedy, really, really sad. And um, you know, I just hope and pray he gets his life together. And um, he's a he's a good guy, man. He just uh, makes some really bad choices. You used to be roommates with him at one point, didn't you? I was, yes. And um, I got to tell you, that was uh, another crazy story of mine. Was um, I just signed with WCW, and and I didn't have no place to live, so he he invited me to, uh, you know, stay with him at his house. And um, I think this might be the first time I shared this story. I don't know if I ever shared this story before, but um, so anyways, I I went to the gym to work out, and I come home to this new apartment I'm staying in. And when I opened the door, all these police officers were like, freeze, don't move. And I was like, okay, don't shoot, you know? And uh, they raided his house because they they suspected he was dealing drugs. And uh, so anyways, uh, he wasn't there, I was there, and I ended up getting arrested. So now I go down to the precinct, I fingerprint and I go through the whole thing, they put me in jail. And, uh, you know, the holding cell, and I'm in there with other, other people. And, and it was so funny because the guys that were in the holding cell with me go, and aren't you the guy on TV? Because I just started wrestling for WCW, you know? So instead of getting my ass kicked in jail, they loved me. <laughs> but eventually they, they obviously dropped the charges, let me out. I have no police record or anything like that. But it was just a crazy time. And it was like, man, I got to get my own place. And, uh, but uh, he, he was very helpful and instrumental getting me into the wrestling world or helped me get there uh, until that point, obviously. But he eventually got in himself, you know, by, by knowing me and coming there. And he's got an amazing look. I mean, the guy was, what, 6'6 six, six or something, and he just had a body like an Adonis, you know. He's just incredible, incredible athlete. Was the party scene pretty uh, heavy in those days in WCW? It was. I mean, it was, uh, especially, you know, when I first started, because it was like, you, you kind of want to fit in. So some of the guys I was riding with back then were having into cocaine, which I just got off of, you know, and yeah. now it was like starting all over again, you know, and making some really bad choices. And oh my gosh. And then I started missing shows. And I remember Dusty Rhodes had me come to CNN Center. I drove in, got in his office, and I'll never forget this. You know, I, I love Dusty Rhodes. I mean, he was the guy that gave me the Johnny B. Bad character. And all the mannerisms I did, you know, I'm so outrageous, it's contagious. Those are all from things that Dusty would do, you know, that he would say, do it like this, and he'd show me how to walk. And, and, we, and, and we'd be laughing so hard together. He was like a dad to me, you know? I mean, I really loved the guy, you know? So when I walked into the, after missing a show and, and just – being irresponsible. I remember walking into his office and it wasn't even before he even said anything. I seen the look on his face, a guy who made my career, who gave me everything. I was broke. Now I'm getting six figures and I'm living this incredible life, you know? And I just remember he looked at me and he said, kid, I made you 
and I can break you. And I just said, Dusty, man, I am so sorry. I promise you I will never miss another show. And I never did. I never missed another show. Um, not that I didn't still do drugs or do stupid things, but I, I never missed a show and I never wanted to let that man down because I really, I just seeing him hurt like that was more than anything he had to say because he could have just kept going off on me, but that's all he said was, I made you and I could break you. Don't ever miss another show. And that, and that was it. But seeing how hurt he was just resonated with me so much and just, um, just a man I truly love. I mean, he was beloved by so many. Now, I'm not sure if you were married by the time you got in WCW. I don't think you were, but no. our fans always like to know what the groupie scene is like with uh, with various wrestlers. Well, you know, I mean, like like anything, you know, there was always women around and, you know, you're making good money and you could afford to go to places and do things. And, and because something about being on that little square box on television does something to people and... Um, there were a lot of women around. It wasn't hard, you know, you go to bars and it'd be like, the wrestlers are here. And there was a lot of party action, a lot of, um, a, a lot of crazy stuff, sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know? It was like a traveling rock show, you know? Who came up with the Bad Blaster? Oh, that was, that was actually me. You know, I, I, I thought about, you know, uh, going to the ring and, and having a little fun with it. You know, at first we had a real little one. You know, I mean, we, we first started with this little bed blaster. Then uh, it was this company called Aero Technics. I said, can you make me a bigger one? You know, and they kept it bigger and bigger. And then, oh my gosh. And then it was like, what am I going to shoot out of it? So we shoot out uh, these, uh, we first would shoot out all this confetti and stuff. And then we started loading it up with real money. And it was like people were, <laughs> we were fighting over getting the money. So we said, okay. So then we made fake money with um, uh, these $100 bills with, with Johnny B. Bat's picture on it. It says, in bad we trust, you know? So it's really, really comical. And and to this day, I meet people who go, man, I got one of your, your uh, the bills you shot out of your can and or, or we shot these pogs out, these little uh, different things that people show me to this day that still have them. Now, you're very well remembered for your matches with Honky Tonk Man and WCW, both because it seemed like you wrestled them a lot, but also, I guess he left WCW because he wasn't under a full-time contract, and I guess he, he didn't want to continue losing to you. Um, what is your thoughts on the feud in that situation? Um, I didn't wrestle Honky Tonk a lot. Um, I, I, I only wrestled him a couple times, and, and the one time was he didn't want to drop uh, the strap to me. I don't know all the reasons behind it. I mean, they're, they're in closed door meetings and you know, I'm just the guy kind of on the outside looking in. I didn't really know all the details to it. And, and the, uh, the bookers never really shared with me. I mean, I'm sure he has his thoughts on it. Um, you know, he, at that time, he just thought it was professionally the best thing for his career. And, you know, you look back, you go, maybe, maybe he was right. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, when you're in the place that I'm in, you just do what you're told, you know, you don't really, um, argue or you, you might have ideas about something and you're not always happy that you have to drop a strap or whatever, but it's business. So you do, you do business. Did you get along with him on a personal level? On a personal level, never had a problem. Never bad word, never argued with him, nothing like that. You know I mean? He just, he had his own perception of what he, is, he wanted in his career. And then I, and I respect that. And you also worked with Brian Pillman. What were those matches like? Oh man, I got to tell you, Brian, uh, we had probably one of my one of my favorite I, I my, maybe the top three favorite matches you know was I think it was called I think it was Fall Brawl or War Games or one of them that we had like a thirty minute match and you know Michael Buffer's the referee and you know and and it was just we we had to go thirty minutes and so Brian and I we went to the, uh, the, the WCW had the power plant. And we'd go down there and we just, you know, he had some great ideas for the match. We did a lot of false finishes and a lot of cool stuff that um, I got it. He, he, he kind of laid out that match and he was kind of the architect of that match. And, and I didn't always get along well with Brian. Like we weren't friends, but we came together for that match and we became really tight. Like, like I had a whole new respect for him, you know, because on previous matches, it didn't seem like he wanted to do what, um, I wanted to do with, with things I was better at. I wasn't a very good wrestler at that time. I was learning. I was going to the power plant and practicing a lot because uh, I was brand new. Remember, I, I got 
I got signed in 91, 91. My first time I ever put on wrestling boots was 90 to go to Malinko school. So I've only been in the business a few months. And, and next thing I know, I'm right. I'm wrestling, you know, Sting and Cactus Jack and Brian Pillman, guys I've been watching on television. So there was a, there was a kind of a apprehension stuff. So you just listen to whatever they said. And I remember some of our first matches were, didn't go really well. And thinking, gosh, I got to wrestle this guy for 30 minutes. Oh, man, it's a long time to be out there on, on, on you know, pay-per-view. So uh, when he laid out the match, I was like, wow, this is really good. And I just started, you know, flowing with Brian. And uh, like I said, I got a whole new, I had a whole new respect for him. I actually was really friendly. We became really friendly after that. And uh, to this day, his son and I are good friends. You know, uh, his son came out to one of my presentations a couple of years ago. We've been really great friends since then. And uh, and watching what he's done now is like just such a, a testament to just, you know, saying I'm going to do something and going after it and doing it. So, but but Brian was, uh, God, God rest his soul. You know, he's, he was a, he was a complex guy, but, uh, you know, what a, what a fire that guy had. When he called you Johnny B. Gay, was that something that an agent came up with, or was that you guys just ad libbing? I never knew he was going to do it, and I don't know if he even knew he was going to do it. I mean, you know, it probably wouldn't fly as well on television today, uh, <laughs> but back then, when he did it, you know, I mean, look at my character I played, you know, it was a very flamboyant character. I mean, I never would come out and say I'm gay, but, but it was like a flamboyant character, you know, outrageous um, so whatever, you know, his perception was of it, um, he said that and it's been forever on YouTube. <laughs> you did some stuff with PN News as well. Uh, he wasn't a very well-liked guy in the back from what I understand. Did you get along with him? I, I did. I had to work with him quite a bit. And, um, uh, you know, he was a good guy, you know, I mean, Everybody, some people just sort of like, uh, you know, oil and water. And, and it's about, I don't know, just not looking at, not judging people, but, but trying to understand people. And I've gotten really good at it as I've gotten older. But back then, I mean, I had my my own things with people, you know. But but uh, PN News, he, he was a good guy. I mean, he, he never bothered me. I mean, um, I mean, obviously, when you're a rapper and some people that, whether they don't like rap or they just don't think he can rap, they hated his character. They hated the gimmick. So therefore, some people judged him for that, and um, and it wasn't wasn't well received or, or wasn't wasn't merited. I, I don't think. And for Kevin Sullivan, he was a booker probably during some periods. You were in WCW. What were your thoughts on him? Um, you know, I didn't have a lot of interaction with Kevin Sullivan. Um, I wasn't close with him, but I mean, you know, after my match, you know, he'd come out in the hallway and, you know, give me a thumbs up or a good job. Or, you know, he said, man, when you're doing this or doing that. And so he, he had some good advice. Um, I, I was, remember, I'm so green back then. I wasn't really involved in a lot of the booking things or in meetings or, you know, they did take you into a room to go over the finish of a match. You, you just go, okay, that's what, that's what it is. So now some guys were very political and they could argue their point. But I didn't know what my point would be. <laughs> so so new at it, you know. So I imagine being that green and having a, a contract. I think you said in another interview, the first year was seventy five grand, second year was double, and this is like literally in your first year of wrestling. Did you have a lot of heat backstage because of that? Um, not so much because they signed a bunch of guys with this new new deal that they had going. It was seventy five one fifty, and then you're on your own. You negotiate your own deal. And um, I negotiated a huge deal after that. Uh, they, they, they doubled my money, plus I got a huge signing bonus. So, um, you know, every year doubling my money, so it was, like, really good. So that gave me so much leverage when I eventually went to the WWE. And you worked with uh, Diamond Dallas Page and Kimberly as well in WCW. How were those uh, matches and dealings with them? Again, some of my favorites were, were working with DDP. Um, to, to this day, he's one of my best friends in the world, okay? And uh, so we used to go to the power plant a lot together and uh, hang out. And, and um, so he was like a really good friend all the way back then. And um, so our matches were, you know, we were both fairly green. And, and we, we weren't one of those guys that 
like they go call in the ring, you know, we, we weren't at that level, you know, so we'd go over, we'd plan our matches out quite a bit and we'd go down to the, uh, the power plant and, and work on our matches. And we really started gelling together. You know, it seems like we were on, on every paper together forever, you know, and uh, everything was like uh, wrestling for the money, wrestling for his ballet, uh, wrestle for this title, you know, the world television title. There was always something, you know, and, um, so we, we had some really good matches. I, I felt we really had some good matches. We really, we really connected and, and gelled together. I think those were actually my favorite matches of DDPs. A lot of people liked him more in the later WCW years, but I liked him when he was a heel for whatever reason. And I liked your character better in WCW too, as probably a lot of fans would agree with me on that. Um, but Kevin Nash, you worked with him a bit too. How was yeah. he? Um, you know what's funny is um, wrestling with, like, in, in when I was with WCW with John and Dad, like, I wrestled DDP probably, man, between 100 and 200 times. I mean, we do so many house shows together and travel all over the world together and wrestle each other every night and stuff like that. So, and, and he never got to beat me. <laughs> Kevin Nash never got to beat me either. <laughs> so, just, I mean, obviously, it's part of the storyline. But, I mean, I'm wrestling Kevin Nash as Vinny Vegas. <laughs> as Oz so they weren't like the the Kevin Nash that we eventually came to know and love but um another guy that just really took off you know and seeing because Kevin was a good guy too man I mean I really like Kevin and, and seeing him just take that that's that leap of faith and go to the WWE at the time WF at the time um was was uh you know just go for it man you know, they're gonna do something with you and they did he became diesel and became very over. Now, I don't know if you've heard this, but I listened to it last night. There's a clip of Eric Bischoff online saying that you were friends, but he really didn't have much of a future for your character at the time you jumped to mm -hmm. WWE. And he alleged in this interview that he didn't really want to keep you at the time that uh, you switched to WWE. What's your version of that? You know, uh, Eric, Eric, man, Eric gave me a huge contract. When um, after my, my second year was up, Eric is the one that, that negotiated that, that, that huge deal I got um, and the signing bonus uh, to keep me on at WCW. And then I did three more years there after that deal. So it was my going to my now my sixth year and making good money, um, I met with Vince, and I said to Vince that I would never, I would never come to WWE unless I got a guarantee. I got a guaranteed contract. Like, he already gave me a guarantee. I already had a contract with Eric, so a good deal. And um, uh, you know, they pretty much matched what, what WWE was going to give me. Uh, but, I, but I told Vince I, I can't come there unless I get a guaranteed deal, and he didn't give out guaranteed deals at the time. And um, he thought about it and he called me back. He goes, we'll give you a guaranteed deal. And then I said, I want a signing bonus too. And he agreed to that. <laughs> and then, so then I realized that this guy really wants me. And I said, I want my wife to fall. This is when you know, I was married now to, to Rena, who Sable, became Sable. I said, I want my wife to fly everywhere I fly. He goes, what? And I go, just listen to me for a second, okay? I see too many divorces in our, in our sport. And all I want is I'd love to see my wife will always be with me because I don't want to go through a divorce. And why not use her as my valet since she's traveling with me? He goes, I, I'm not, I'm just concerned about you right now. So I, so he agreed to it without even seeing my wife. So now I have the signing bonus. I have the guaranteed contract and, um, and I got my, my, my wife flying with me. Okay. So he sends me a ticket to sign the contract to come to New York and discuss what character I'm going to be at WWE. WBF at the time. And uh, so he sends me my plane ticket. And I said, I call him back. I go, hey, Vince, there's only one ticket here. He goes, well, well why do you need more than one? I go, my wife flies everywhere I fly. And he goes, oh, my goodness, I have never heard of this before. And he sent another ticket for my wife to come. So me and Rena get on the plane. We fly to, to, to New York, to Stanford, Connecticut. And uh, we, we meet with Vince. And when she walks in with me, he goes, I got to put her on TV, just like that. And that's how it all started with Sable was born that day. So then we started thinking about names and we came up with the name Sable. 
And that's how she got her name and her, her, uh, first deal was Vince really was, you know, he, he really admired her and, and was kind of just taken back by her. And she was really, she looked great when we, when we went there. What other names? I heard you say that they gave you a list of several names uh, when you were deciding on Sable. Do you recall any of the other names they had as options? Um, I, I, I can't remember. There's a whole list of them, you know, but I just remember Sable just really jumping out, you know? There was, the, the, I mean, I, there was names like, like you know, because the wild man, like it, the whole thing about this character, Wild Man, I remember when we first sat down and discussed the Wild Man, you know, it was like, I remember Vince saying to me, he goes, can you, can you do a Tarzan yell? I said, no, I, I, I don't have a very strong voice. My voice crackles when I, when I talk loud, you know, it's very raspy. So I can't like the, you know, so I said, I, I can't really do that. He goes, yeah, we, but think about this character, uh, you know, the, the Wild Man. And I thought, ooh, man, okay. I mean, here I am, Johnny Goodbad, an outrageous character, uh, which was fun to play. It was my favorite character because it's not me. It's just like this, you're playing this, this role every night. So now I'm thinking, what the hell's a wild man? Am I, am I from the jungle? I mean, with my Tarzan? What am I? You know, so I, I didn't really connect with it. And of course, Sable being the one, one you know, one, one time we got her in this, leather outfit then we got her in long gowns it was like we're just so confused on what to do we tried to do the old uh, randy macho man elizabeth where she's beautiful in a gown and we said ah, that didn't work then we put her in sexy stuff and they're like whoa and you know they're they're cheering louder for my valet than they are for me going to the ring and i'm doing all this crazy work in the ring and they're cheering for the valet and uh which which was was, was fine but it didn't sit well with the office because they want to get the wrestler over you know but when I said didn't sit well, meaning that they're looking at like, wow, this girl's really getting over. We need to get the guy over too, you know? So uh, we had some had some killer matches. King of the Ring with Stone Cold Steve Austin was a, was a great match back then. Um, had some good matches with uh, some of the guys there. Um, I always had good matches with, with uh, Triple H. And uh, so um, really thought that I was able to do this. Then I, then I blew out my knee. And now I need eight months off. I remember some of this is where it really got tough because I was the first wrestler to get a guaranteed contract. Well, even though you aren't wrestling, you get paid a very, very little. It's not enough to live on, you know, but I'm getting my full, you know, um, 10 grand a week or whatever it was back then, you know, and uh, it did not sit well with a lot of guys. I'm sitting home for eight months collecting and they're out there getting paid on whether the, the show brought in 5,000 people or 10,000 people. They, they didn't know what they were getting paid, you know? So there was a lot of animosity. Um, and the other thing that was really different was when I was with WCW, I was one of the guys, you know, hanging out with them, going to bars with them, driving with them. You know, now I'm only with my wife. They don't really, I'm not building relationships with the guys, which looking back now, totally stupid. I mean, wish, not even wish it. You know, with all the paths I took in my life, ended up to work right where I am now, and I'm I couldn't be happier or more blessed in my life now. But when you look back and you say, "Oh, that probably should have done that," you know, if I had more of a connection with the guys and drove and worked out with the guys instead of always driving with my wife and being with my wife, and it's like I'm we're secluded, and people started treating us like that. And then, of course, once um, I blew out my knee and Sable started really getting over there become more animosity and you know it's it's a business where you know honestly how many spots are available for television maybe 20 25 you know really when you think about it, how many spots are available in a, in a in a one or two hour show or pay-per-view can they put in so many matches you know and if you're not ready to go jacked up there are a hundred thousand guys behind you that are so when you you don't want to lose your spot but you don't want someone taking your spot so when we get elevated, it took someone's spot away. And uh, of course, now I'm, my, I'm not wrestling anymore because of, my, because of my knee. And Sable moves into a very prominent role with the company. They're putting a lot of airtime into her. And all of a sudden, uh, Playboy magazine comes along and all these things. She's doing magazine covers and it's become very popular. And I remember at the time, I think her, her merchandise was selling just behind Stone Cold's. I mean, it was incredible, you know. But 
I got to tell you, I couldn't have been, I couldn't have been more blessed or happier for us because I, they were back at the Brinks truck at our house, you know, and I was so blessed. It was like, so what if my career isn't going good? You know, we're going to be married. We'll be married forever. <laughs> so you look at it as like, what a blessing this is. I didn't care that I wasn't getting over and she was. I mean, sure, I would have loved to get over, but the joy of seeing her just be catapulted to the to the atmosphere was an incredible feeling, you know? I remember just sitting home on, watching her on television while I was taking care of our daughter. So proud of her, you know, that she was out there. And whether it's even, I remember they used her one day just to, um, um, model Stone Cold's 316 shirt, and she walked out, and the place went bananas. You know, it was just incredible. What was the issue between her and Luna backstage? Well, I mean, you know, some people would come off and say Rena was aloof, you know, didn't get along with the girls as well. I mean, there's there's different sides of stories, you know, and I really like Luna. I mean, she was crazy funny, you know, and, uh, it seems like me and Goldis were kind of the trying to keep the peace between us because when when we had matches, the chemistry was incredible. I mean, Rena didn't even know how to wrestle, but we could do enough where the place would the, we'd blow the roof off the, the the building because it was when once they got in the ring and Rena attacked uh, Luna or Fable attacked Luna, the place went crazy. You know, so we build up for that whole thing, and Luna played that role so well. And Luna, being a top wrestler that she was obviously working with someone who's never wrestled before to make it look good. You know, it, there, there may be some, and I'm not saying there was, because I, I, I can only look at it back now and say, maybe there's egos involved. Maybe there was animosity. Maybe Rena was aloof to her in the dressing room. You know, wh whatever it was, there was friction there. And, um, you know, but Louie never brought in the ring or never hurt Sable. You know, she never was unprofessional, but she voiced her opinion backstage. And, um, and it was, uh, you know, just unfortunate situation back then. And it was known that uh, Sonny, of course, didn't get along with Sable either. Did you feel that uh, when you were back there? Yes. I mean, that was, that was heavy because, and, and, you know, to this day, man, I really like her. She she's a one. We, we've done some conventions. I've seen her, and and once in a while we might text each other online or something. But she's wonderful. I mean, I mean, she has her own issues. We're all going through stuff, our bellies and peaks and bellies in life and stuff, you know. And she's had her her, her things, but to me, she was always so nice, you know. Um, I mean, you know, now we we get along. If I seen her, I'd give her a big hug, you know. We got no no animosity, but but back then, Sunny was the girl. I mean, Sonny was the, she was it, man. And then all of a sudden, someone comes in. Remember, it's all about the spot you have. And when you elevate someone, someone has to come down. So Sonny wasn't ready to give up that spot, you know. And um, and, and not, not that she deserved to or, or didn't. It was just the way the company calls the shots. And you have to do what the company says. They, they look at who they want to elevate. And sometimes as a fan, you shake your head and go, why are they pushing that guy and not this guy? You know, we, we don't always understand why rhyme or reason. You, you can see a million interviews about guys that, you know, were on top. And all of a sudden, um, I mean, Stone Cold went through a situation where he, he wasn't going to drop the belt. I think it was to Lesnar or someone. I, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, I remember like, he didn't want to lose to Lesnar or something. Yeah. And he walked away. He said, no, it's professionally. It's not what I want to do. You know, but he, he had that stroke and could do that. And I mean, I think he, he regretted it later on. Looking back, I think he, he said some things that he said, you know, it's kind of stupid to walk away and do that. But, uh, um, you know, we were we were in a position then where we're, she was really getting pushed. They had Playboy issues coming out. They had all kinds of things they had behind her. So now the WWE machine is behind her, pushing her. Now it's like, Boom, you know, putting her on some television shows. She's on Entertainment Tonight. She's on all these mainstream shows that a lot of wrestlers weren't getting on at the time. And, of course, being the first girl to do Playboy was a big deal back then. Now, how did you actually meet Sable? A lot of the fans wanted me to ask you that. You know, I, I shared the story before. It was when I was with WCW Wrestling. We got married um, a couple of years before I ever went to WWE. We were just... My wife, we, we, uh, I adopted her child, um, Mariah, who we're real tight to this day. I love her to death, my, and I got a little granddaughter now. Um, but we, we, me, DDP, and Marcus would travel together. 
And we used to play this stupid game that's called give her your best line. And so, in other words, what it was is if we saw like a hot chick, um, one of us would say, uh, like if, I, if it was me, I'd go, hey, hey uh, DDP, give her your best line. He goes, oh, man. And he'd have to say something to this girl or whatever to <laughs> come up with some line to try to meet her, you know? So, anyways, we'd do this and we'd just be laughing because most of the time people would go, what? You know, or, anyways, we're, we're in a, uh, a restaurant. It was a Quincy's restaurant in Jacksonville, Florida. And the Quincy's has this, like, kind of, you, it's kind of a buffet line, you know, where you get a tray and you go by and you order your food or whatever. And so uh, we're in this buffet line, me, DDP, and Mark, um, Marcus, and we're almost at the cash register. And all of a sudden, this girl with two of her friends, Rena and two of her friends, walk in. And uh, DDP goes, I'll never forget, he goes, bro, give her your best line. <laughs> I was like, oh, man. And she, Rena was a pretty girl. So I took a napkin. And I wrote, do you like me? Yes or no, circle one. I mean, some of you do in elementary school. So I give it to the cashier. I said, when that girl comes by, give her this napkin and tell her it's from me. I'll be sitting right over there. So DDP and Marcus are busting out thinking this is the stupidest thing they've ever seen, right? We're laughing. So we're all watching her trying to you know, eat our food. We're watching her get the note. She grabs the note. She looks at it and just sets it on her tray and walks away. So it was like, and they go, oh, that was a good one. Like we were laughing so hard because she just blew it off, you know? About 15 minutes later, the waitress comes over to our table and she has the napkin. And she goes, that girl up there told me to give you this. And I open it up and she wrote in maybe and circled it. <laughs> so it was at that point I went over to their table. I told her, hey, we're wrestling in town tonight. Would you and your friends like to go? We'll leave you tickets at the will call window. And that's how I had my first date with Rena. And to, to carry on with that story, something else funny happened that night. So we go to the wrestling. Uh, we, go, we, we, we do our match and everything, and, and they wait for us after. And we go to this hotel that we're staying at. And uh, um, I, have, I have my own room. Marcus has his own room. DP has his own room. Um, so usually I would room with, with one of those guys, but knowing that Rena was coming that night, I thought maybe I'd have my own, room, my own room and hang out with her, you know? So, uh, we, after the, after the match with the bar, we have a bunch of drinks, we go back to my hotel room. We're hanging out in the hotel room. All of a sudden there's a knock at the door and I get up and I, I look to the little window and I could see it's Buff Bagwell. And he goes, he goes, he goes, Johnny, Johnny. Cause he was called going, Johnny from Johnny. Gibbett. And I, I opened the door. He goes, he goes, I, I got I to gotta talk to Rita for a second. And she, you know, we, 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 were, we were fully dressed. We weren't doing anything. We were just sitting on the bed watching TV. And um, so he comes in and he starts pretending he's got like a pool stick. And then he, he does like he's playing pool. She falls back on the bed and starts laughing. And what it was is Buff was in his, Marcus was in his, his hotel room and he was flipping to the TV channels and he saw one of those like one nine hundred numbers, <laughs> where you could meet this girl, and it was her, because she was a model and she did commercials. Oh and wow! So you mean it's not I, those girls on the line when you call? Yes, and it was it was so funny that I'm in the room with the nine hundred girl. <laughs> so, and it was just a silly thing that happened, and then but she was a, a an amazing amazing girl, and we got really tight, and uh, we got married in nineteen ninety four. And, uh, you know, she just was happy being a housewife, staying at home. And then, but then we went to the WWE or WWF um, is when, you know, our lives were forever changed uh, because of, you know, hiring a nanny to, to take care of our daughter. And it caused a lot of issues with our daughter. And, you know, she had, you know, to this day, I mean, she has issues about, you know, being home without her parents, you know. So it's something you always remember. And of course, you're well remembered for the little angle you did with Mr. Perfect in WWE. Any thoughts on that? Uh, I really like that guy. I actually got to wrestle Mr. Perfect one time. He is one of the most smooth. I tell you, you know, it's called a dance, you know, and there's dance partners that can make you look so good because even if you don't know how to dance, Mr. Perfect was 
I, he looks like he could be killing you, and you don't even feel it. Like you don't even know if you're you're selling it right because he's so smooth. You know, he was truly one of the best. Um, I mean, the angle was obviously I'm dropping the strap to to Triple H. It was his first title, actually. Um, and you know, the way they did it was, you know, I, I pretty much won the match until I get hit, hit over the head with a chair. So it's kind of like the old slip on the banana peel. So it didn't really make me look bad or, or so on, but it was the end of my, my reign as the, as the uh, Intercontinental Champion. And, of course, you brought it up earlier, the, the King of the Ring match with Austin. You ended up splitting his lip open, and that led to the Austin 316. <laughs> so you subconsciously <laughs> caused it. Any memories of working with him? Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, Stone Cold and... Um, DDP and Triple H are probably three guys I wrestled more than anybody. I mean, a couple hundred times, only because we were in WCW together, and then of course WWF together. You know, so um, Stone Cold, truly one of the best. I mean, that guy is a ring general. He he was so good to to work with, and always and he was you know one of the few guys that like you know I had certain moves that I was really good at you know, or, or it could do, you know, and you can't do them with everybody because some guys just can't, you know, flip and flop like that. There wasn't a move I could do that Stone Cold couldn't, you know, roll with or do it, do it with me and make me look good. He was amazing, man. But it was so funny because um, uh, before I, I did his podcast, he, he even wrote, wrote on Twitter, he said, um, uh, I got a, I owe, I owe John 316, or I wrote, I, I owe Austin 316 to Mark Merrill. If he never split up, split up my lip, I never would have had the opportunity to hear what Jake said and, and come back and use that line. So I just remind him of the royalties he actually owes me. Okay. <laughs> no, he's a, I, I really, you know, something that he's another guy. I, I didn't really have a, I guess a, a, a real friendship with when we were working together, he was, he was pretty much business. And, and you know, he was always with, um, you know, whether it was, you know, when he was with Lady Blossom or Deborah or whatever. I mean, you know, she traveled with yeah. his-, his uh, Lady his Blossom wanted me to tell you hi, by the way. Oh, she's a sweetheart. She was so nice. She was always so kind. So Steve and I have never really had like a friendship, but um, we have such an admiration for each other now. I mean, you know, he. He really is. I, I, I not only did I, when I did this podcast, we when we finished the podcast, we talked on the phone for like a probably forty five minutes. You know, just just talking about old times and and uh, you know he's he's really proud of what I'm doing now. So it really, you know, to even that even realizes some of the things that I've been doing lately is it was pretty cool. And um, I, I just really got to really have a high esteem for Steve. Yeah, it seemed like you had a good chemistry with him on that podcast. A lot of fans brought up before I did this interview, I guess there was some rumor, I don't know where it comes from or if you've heard it, that I guess he was supposed to have a run with you, allegedly, but you took a power bomb from Sable and then he x it. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, yeah, there there is. I mean, from what I from what I hear, I mean, Steve will have his own take on it, but just from what I hear, um, we were supposed to have a run together and uh, when when they saw, you know, I, of course, that was mine. I brought it to Vince Russo and said, hey, we want to get her over you. Know, let's do this. And, and, you know, at the time, like I said, I, I just wanted we she was on such she was on such a trajectory. It was like, just keep it going, you know. So for her to sable bomb me, be like, oh, my gosh, you know. But of course, it took me out of um, working with Stone Cold because, you know, think about from his point of view, he's the baddest one of the bad, baddest asses on the planet. And it's like. This girl just kicked his ass. I'm going to let him get in the ring. I'm going to bump around for him. So totally understand it. And looking back on it now, it's like, you know what? He's probably right. You know, you, you don't want to, you don't want to have a, 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 you know, so-called girl beat you up in the ring and then go and fight the top guy in the company and almost beat him. What does it say to the girl? Is what would she do to Stone Cold? You know, so I could understand where he was coming from. And, uh, but again, if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't I would have changed anything only because of, like I said, all the paths I took ended up to where I am right now. And uh, maybe things would have changed. Who knows? And I guess Mick Foley took a shot at you in his book or something, because I guess he was jealous that you had a, a guaranteed contract when you first came in and, and he didn't. Did you guys ever get a chance to discuss that and kind of put it behind you? 
We did. And I got to tell you, I love Mick Foley. I, I think he is one of the kindest. He has so much empathy and compassion for other people. And I, I mean, I'm really going to say I love Mick Foley. But Mick Foley did something that, you know, I never was upset about that. I mean, when, gosh, you could go through YouTube and see thousands and thousands of wrestlers that are bashing other people. And, you know, it's, it's you know, I, I just try not to go I go there, you know. But Mick wrote me a, a, a beautiful message on Twitter one day. And he just said, you know, back then, you know, um, you know, I was a little caught up in the business and, you know, because I, I, you know, look, at, I'm getting these guaranteed contracts ahead of Austin and, and Foley and two of the top guys that I've ever read, put on wrestling boots, you know, and, and here's this guy getting this guaranteed huge contract and they're busting their ass on the road, getting paid, you know, a tenth of what I was getting paid, you know, so I can understand the animosity and, and you know, him, him saying that in his book, you know, I can understand where he was coming from at the time, but even looking back that he even took the time to apologize to me. And, and since then we have, we've been great friends, you know, and not that I was um, upset with him or, or, cause I did understand where he was coming from. And, and sure. You, I look at it as someone that, um, you know, was, didn't accomplish nearly the things I accomplished is making 10 times more money than me is go, why is that dude making so much money? You know, but you know, when you really look at it from my point of view, what, what was I supposed to do? Go, you know, Vince, uh, no, you're, you're not paying those guys that much. I, I think I just want to get paid what those guys are getting paid. Of course not. You have to look out for yourself and your family. And, and Mick, looking back now, could totally understand it from, from my point of view. And um, uh, like I said, just, just a great guy. I actually remember watching you wrestle Mick at a house show in Hull, Quebec, back in 1996 and that was like before WWE blew up I remember you and Sable were there and there was only about a thousand fans in attendance then the next year you guys were back in the big arenas and there was like five or six thousand fans so it's amazing how big WWE blew up from the time you arrived to like the next few years later what was it like being part of that boom you know the uh, you know like they call it the Attitude Era. You know, and you and when you look around, when you when I think back now, and I'm in a dress room, and you look around, who's there? You know, there's The Rock, there's Triple H, Degeneration X. You know, um, you know Mick Foley. I mean, you look around this this locker room that had you know the most incredible names in professional wrestling, uh, Shawn Michaels. You know, Ric Flair. You know, and it was just incredible to be there in that time of probably, maybe some people might say some of the greatest times ever in the, in the business, you know, uh, that I was actually there and got to experience that. So I look back, what a blessing that was to be a part of the Attitude Era. And you were, of course, part of the Brawl for All. I'm not sure if you saw the new documentary that came out about it. I, I didn't see it, but, I, but a bunch of people have written to me and said that, um, you know, that they, they did talk about that. What are your memories of that? I actually rewatched your your fights last night. It seemed <laughs> with JBL, he was way beyond your weight class. And then Steve Blackman was just doing takedowns, which, of course, you're a boxer, not not an amateur. Uh, um, you know, the, the funny thing was, is I never even got hurt. I mean, there's a lot of guys that got hurt really seriously, you know. Um, the thing was about this was, when it came to me, I used to be a boxer, but I was a boxer at 178 pounds. And I, I've had 14 surgeries, took my, my shoulders, my elbows. I had no, like, like the speed or, or the control I would, I once had as being a top flight boxer. So when people said, you're a boxer, you're going to do great. It was like, you have no idea. I can't even do what I used to do, you know, but I still have a fairly good reflexes and I, I didn't really get hit at all. No one really hit me. It's like I could move my head enough to stay out of the way. Like even if I would have fought someone like Bart Gunn or Butterbean, they never would have really connected with those big knockout punches that I that a lot of guys were getting knocked out by. You know, being a boxer, you you really learn how to um, you have great prefer peripheral vision and stuff. So, anyways, to make a long story short, yeah, Steve Blackman, he just kept taking me down. It was like so frustrating. It was like one of those things where you just go, "When is this thing going to end?" You know, and then finally it was over. It was like, "Oh, that was." That was terrible. But you know what? I think we got paid five or 10 grand for each match. I can't remember what it was. But um, so it was this over, done with. I'm, I'm out of it. All of a sudden, a black man got injured. And they called me up. And they said, hey, uh, black man was supposed to fight Bradshaw. You want to take his place? I was like, 
absolutely. Because Bradshaw and I, I didn't, at that time, I did not like that guy at all. And I know he hated my guts. When, when we wrestle each other, man, I have never been powerbombed harder in my entire life. Like he always wanted to hurt me and he didn't like me and he made it real clear he didn't like me. And, 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 you know, at the time he had, I don't know what he could, they called the wrestler's jury or whatever they would call that. Wrestler's up. court. Yes. Yeah. And I never got involved with that stuff. I never played to it. So I, I, I really wanted to fight Bradshaw. It was like, absolutely. You know? And, um, you know, the fight went three rounds and they, they called it a draw. And then we had to go one more round and they, they gave the, the decision to him. Um, and again, you know, he's a big guy that, that took me down and, and, and won, won the match. But now two guys that did not like each other at all. Now, fast forward 20 years later, he does so many great things, man. I mean, he's he's he is a entrepreneur that used his wealth to help. Uh, these kids in Haiti with water in, in, in Africa or whatever that, that is. He does just so many amazing things. And and I actually um, reached out to him and wrote him and told him how proud I am of him and what he's done. And he wrote me back a beautiful letter. And and now here's a guy. It's amazing how life is, you know, when you, when you really can look at something differently, you know, instead of always saying, I hate that person or I don't. I always found that forgiveness is the key to moving on in life. And, and I, 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 man, I'm not, I don't remember to think of any animosity towards the guy now or something he might've said about me or, or whatever, but I know if I ever see him, I give him a big hug, man, and just thank him for everything he has done uh, for helping so many kids, man. He's just, he, he really is amazing. And, and uh, again, a lot of love for Bradshaw. So the clip of him, there is a clip of him speaking negatively about you on the internet. That's before you guys made up. I was always <laughs> Even if it was now, I wouldn't be mad. <laughs> that's that's how I am. You know what? There are people are always going to say negative things. You know, see, it, I always say, don't let criticism, you know, go to your heart, man. Because people are always going to criticize you. Life is not perfect. I don't care who you are. There's always going to be someone. There's always going to be haters out there. But uh, um, as far as I know, man, um, you know, there's the the we buried the hatch a long time ago. And just. From the fight perspective, that was an unsanctioned fight done under the disguise of pro wrestling. A match between you versus him with that weight difference would not have been sanctioned by a boxing commission. I know, but uh, yeah. it's WWF. <laughs> I'm just letting people know just so they know, uh, just because that was popping into my head when I was watching that fight last night. But you, I just, do, I, you I, did have good movement. The other thing I noticed, you wore wrestling boots. What's that? You wore wrestling boots, which would seem to me would be a negative. It is, yeah. But, you know, I take nothing away from Bradshaw. He is a tough son of a gun. I mean, you know, that is just a – you ask anybody, that guy is one tough guy. And one other issue I guess you guys had back there, I guess at one point – X Pack uh, defecated or something in Sable's bag or something. Well, you've done true? homework. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, funny thing, okay? Looking back now, it's hilarious, okay? When we decided that we were done with wrestling, um, the European tour was our last. That was it. We're done. We, we, we had plenty of money to live the rest of our lives. And we got in the uh, the, the um, car to go back, and I started smelling something. It's like, what is that smell? I mean, it's just like a dog defecated in the car. What, I'm like, what is going on here? And she's going, oh, my gosh, what is that? And she opens her bag, and she finds the poop. And it was like, oh, that's so disgusting, you know? It was like horrible. We, you know, we, we had to throw out the bags and everything, you know? It was just terrible. But we didn't know who did it at the time, you know? But it was like, it was the, the straw that broke the camel's back. It was like, we're done. We're out of here. We're never coming back, you know? And we quit. We quit the bit. Remember, I quit with a contract of three fifty a year, guaranteed, and... Signing bonus, merchandise, and everything else, right? So on top of 350, who knows how much money we could we could have made, you know? Um, 
three years left on my country. I walked away and said, keep it. I don't even care. I'm done. And I quit. And, um, you know, my, my, my wife at the time, Sable, Rena, quit with me. And we just said, decided to move to Hollywood and she'd pursue a movie career. And, and, and that's what we did. But never knowing who was the one that um, defecated in her, in her bag. Uh, and then when it came out to that we did know it was X-Pac, it was, um, I don't know, it's hilarious to me now, you know? we I've actually talked with him about it. It's like we have no animosity towards the guy. It was a funny rip when you really think about it. Well, I guess in the end it helped towards Sable's settlement too, probably. Well, that was a, another thing, you know? They're, they're you know, I, I can't really say anything about that, you know, but... It's probably yeah. a non-disclosure, I guess, yeah, whenever it is. But think about this. If it was such a great settlement, you know, no matter what, she wanted to go back, you know. And that was the biggest shock of my life at the time. Um, you know, she tried her hand at movies in, in L.A. And we even got an apartment we rented for a year out there, a beautiful apartment. And, uh, um, and then she, I remember one night she come to me, she goes, what would you think about me going back to wrestling? I, said, I was like dumbfounded, like shocked. Like, first of all, it wouldn't be safe because of all the, the lawsuit and the sexual harassment, all the things that were brought out that you can't go back to that place. And I said, Vince would never take you back. And she goes, well, I called him. I go, you called Vince? I didn't know about it. And she said that he would think about it. I was dumbfounded. And um, so once... Vince agreed to bring her back. She had to go and apologize to all the top guys at the time, Undertaker and I can't remember who else she had to apologize to, but that was part of her thing was going to apologize to some of these people. And uh, I remember I stayed home. Obviously, I was going to stay. I wasn't going back. There's no way. But I would stay home and, and take care of our daughter. So while um, Sable was on the road, I was taking care of our daughter. And... Um, and, you know, that's when uh, our marriage ended. So I've heard you say it on some other podcasts, but our fans are different fans. So I was wondering if you could tell uh, the story on basically how she ended up leaving you, I guess. Well, it was every night before um, Mariah went to bed, we'd call her and we'd say, how's your day? And it was always really good conversation. Mariah always wanted to talk to her mom before she went to bed. And and, um, and and I just remember that. It just seemed like it was getting harder and harder to get in touch with her. And then there was days that she didn't even answer her phone. It was go to voicemail. And I was thinking, Why? where's my wife, you know? I know the, the, the wrestling matches are over. They got to be either driving to the next town or, or in a hotel room. And there was no phone call back. There was no nothing you know so i remember um leaving a very nasty message like you know i can't believe you don't call us back uh you know this is rude well i don't care remember what i said but anyways i started feeling bad for saying that you know and i go you know what let me and i knew her access code to a phone like she knew mine we we're a married couple you know so i called back the the phone and i go i'm gonna delete that message i don't want her to hear that you know she's probably got enough stress on the road I dialed the number and I, it says, you have two unheard messages. I thought, okay, so I got to listen to the first one to, to, to get to mine, you know? And it's this man's voice apologizing for the night before. And, you know, and I was like, what the heck? And it was, it was pretty graphic and I was very taken back. And then I was realizing that she's got... She's seeing somebody else, you know, and it was, it was devastating. I mean, I thought we'd be married forever, you know, and, and I just remember, and anyone that's gone through a breakup or lost a loved one, you, you know the feeling. It's like just your heart, you can't sleep, you can't eat, you, you're just miserable. And um, I didn't say anything, and then um, I deleted my message, and then I picked her up at the airport, and I, I said, I want to know who this is. And she goes, what are you talking about? So she first denied it, and then she just said that she's going to be moving out, and she wants a divorce. And it was like my world ended there, man. You know, the most devastating, hurtful, um, didn't know what I was going to do. 
because um, now, you know, you, you obviously split everything up and you, you go your own way and life changes. And uh, I got back into drugs. I got back into living a horrible life, horrible financial decisions, the housing market tanked, everything that could go wrong went wrong in my life to the point where I just didn't even want to be here anymore. And then, um, you know, just, just making an amazing comeback in life. And that's part of the story I've shared at schools and churches and corporations now was that, you know, no matter how bad it is, no matter what you're going through, you know, man, there's a plan, a purpose for your life. And, 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 we, and we could all come back from adversity, especially like we're all going through this pandemic now. We had to find a way to re- I'm doing 250 events a year, traveling all over the world, all of a sudden it ends. I, I got no place to go, no schools, no places, no, no, we can't go anywhere. So what do we do? We make a studio and we're doing virtual presentations from our studio now. Reinvent yourself, you know, never giving up, always finding a way to keep going, keep moving forward in life. So after that happened, you know, I mean, obviously she, she um, uh, ended up marrying Brock and they got kids together. And God, I'm so, I'm, I'm really, I, if I ever had, like, I, I don't talk to Rena anymore. We, I mean, not that. I don't want to, or not that we just have, you know, she's in her own life. I have my own life. We've gone our separate ways. But if I ever could say anything to her is thank you. I mean, if she never left me, I never would have done the things I've done. I never would have met the people I met. I never would have had this amazing company changing lives all over the world. I never would have done this. This was, this was done out of, you know, finding your passion in life. So I, I have no animosity towards them. I'm so happy for their life and their kids and everything for their success. But I, I just know that, man, I'm in a place now that I've been blessed to help other people. And there's no greater joy than that. Did you ever have a talk with Brock or anything since that happened? Like get to see him in person and any type of apology or anything from him? No, and I don't expect a Christmas card or anything. But you know what? He doesn't. He doesn't owe me an apology. I mean, you know, life. Like I said, I I can't I can't thank my ex enough for for leaving because you know, last thing you want to do is you don't want to have someone in your life that's not in love with you. You know, just to just to just to make you happy. You know, that's not that's not that's not a marriage has to be two people that really love each other that. They want to be with each other so badly, you know, and there's ups and downs in marriages, but you work through them and, but you would never want to be with someone who's not in love with you. So and, it all turned out good. And I understand when she was doing all those playboys, I think there was four playboys all together. You attended quite a few playboy mansion parties. What were some of the things that you may have witnessed at the playboy mansion? <laughs> Well, I mean, without getting, you know, graphic, I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty wild. I mean, you know, we went to the, the Halloween party, have birthday parties. We went to the Midsummer Night Dream parties. Um, you know, Hap was really tight with, um, with Darlene back then. I mean, you know, she, she had one of the, I think it was the fastest selling Playboy in history at that time. You know, it was incredible how, because the, the, the machine was behind her. The WWF machine was behind her. So it did amazing. You couldn't even find that magazine for a while. They had to do reprints of it and everything. It was incredible how well it was. So, of course, you know, it gave Playboy a big shot in the arm. So they treated her like, uh, you know, their, their top girl. And they, they flew us in. We'd, we'd hang out there and, uh, it was uh, an incredible, you know, the, the mansion and being around and then you're, you're just sitting there and all of a sudden James Kahn walks in. There's Carmen Electra. There's Pam Anderson. I mean, it was, it was incredible. The people you would see at these parties. Wow. And I guess you would just sit around and mingle with these people. And would people be wearing clothes? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it was uh, it was very scantily clad. The girls yeah. that were there, when some girls would just go topless and um, or ha- you know have paint. A lot of girls were painted. You know, they had their painted stuff on. But I'm sitting there. I know, like one time, I'm at the bar, and this guy kind of moves in kind of quickly and kind of nudges me. You know, and not not on purpose or, or not being rude or anything, but he was just trying to get in to, to get a, 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 to get the bartender's attention. And so I kind of spin around, and, and he spins around. We look at each other. It's Rod Stewart. I'm like, yeah. you know, what I mean? this is Rod Stewart sitting next to me at the bar. So it was uh, it was pretty incredible. The people you would see there. 
No, I've never been married to a Playboy model, let alone a best-selling one. Is that awkward at all? Like, or does it cause you any jealousy to know that all those people saw your wife naked? No, I mean, looking back on my life now, you know, it, it was, it was a, it was a mistake. It really was, and not, not. God, please don't take this as being um, something against her. It was, it was a decision we made, and not, not her. And, and you know, here we are, Christians. You know, we're going to church and we're raising our daughter in the church. And next thing you know, your 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 wife is a playboy. You know, and millions and millions of people are seeing her naked. And, you know, and I remember we were sitting at a table and, and, I, and I, I've shared this story before. I don't remember who said it first or I can't remember. And I, if it was me, I would solely admit it, but I don't, I, don't, I don't really remember. But one of us said, um, I know this is wrong. This is sin, but God will forgive us. And, and he will forgive us. But the problem is that there's, there's consequences to your actions in life. And from that moment on, I really believe it was the end of our marriage. I really believe it. You know, it doesn't matter how much money you were making, because remember uh, that second Playboy, I mean, she got well over a million dollars for doing that, just to do the shoot on top of quarter an issue of their normal sales and all the things that she got for that was in incredible, you know? Um, it, but looking back, it's like, it didn't even matter. I mean, it ruined our life, you know? And it's not something you look back on your life and go, I am so proud that my wife was in Playboy. God, it's like I, when people even mention it now to me, it's kind of like, yeah, I'm kind of glad that chapter of my life's over with. You know, I couldn't imagine being married to someone or, or wanting your wife to do that, you know. But don't get me wrong, I'm not one who's square. I mean, everybody has their own reasons, and I don't want to come across as better than anybody because I'm not. But just now in my life, I have a whole different take on it. And you were working the night of the infamous Montreal screw job. Um, what were your thoughts on that when that was going on? I actually got dressed right next to Brett. We were sitting next to each other in the locker room when, when um, you know, that whole thing transpired. I, oh, my gosh. I, I remember uh, I remember really for the first time ever in a locker room being scared, like thinking there is going to be a riot. There's going to be people going to get hurt really bad. Because this guy, Brett was, I mean, he, under Wayne Gretzky, Gretzky, Gretzky is Brett Hart, you know what I mean, <laughs> for Canada. And uh, I just remember it was, it was a scary time. And, of course, you know, Brett going to knock Vince out. And, and then you think about what's, what's the detrimental effects going to happen here? Are some guys going to fight these guys? Or what's, what's going to happen? Whose side do you take here? You know what I mean? I didn't even understand. I mean, I didn't, nobody knew about it. Nobody knew there was going to be a screw job that night. It was like common knowledge. Nobody knew. Brett didn't know. You know? So, Were you out of the dressing room by the time the, the attack on Vince happened? Um, I, I can't remember exactly when that happened. Um, I just remember wanting to get out, get, get out of there, get my, my, my wife out of there because it, it felt really unsafe. It felt like people are going to get hurt bad. And like, riot, like there was going to be a riot. Now, when you search your name, uh, a lot of stuff pops up about Chris Benoit because you were one of the wrestlers that did a lot of interviews uh, shortly after that horrific uh, tragedy happened. Uh, what are your thoughts on that overall? I know you wrestled Benoit quite a few times. I did, yeah. And, and I really like Chris. Oh, my gosh. We, we got along great. He, he was – Chris was a kind person, you know? I mean, whatever happened – that night, how he snapped or whatever, you know, whatever the reason for that happening. I mean, I don't know if anybody will ever really know, you know. I mean, obviously, um, they say he had brain damage or whatever. I mean, that's, you know, whether it's scientific or whatever, I don't, I don't really know. But I, I know that, you know, the reason I spoke out was that if I wanted to do steroids, I could do steroids. If I wanted to take pills or whatever, well, there was no, there was no, um, there's nobody watching or anybody, you know, and, and, and guys are dying. You remember, this isn't like, you know, he's the only one that died. There was, there was quite a few guys that died while I was there, you know. And, you know, I mean, I mean think about Brian Pillman not coming to the, the arena. I mean, there was, there was just a lot of tragedies, you know. And 
there's, there's two types of people. There's people that say something needs to be done. And then there's a person that says, I want to go out there and do something. And for years, I was guilty. Why don't they do this about this? Or why don't they do this about that? You know, we don't have health insurance. We don't have this. We don't. And I remember speaking out. And, and I look back now, it's like, there's not a lot of wrestlers that actually died like when I was there, you know? And maybe, you know, and now any wrestler that has drug or alcohol um, problems can go get rehab for free at WWE. I, I'm WWE's dying. They can pay for it, you know? That was all brought in because we spoke out against it. We said enough was enough. And they have strict drug testing now. I mean, I think they have like a little bit drug testing now. So, you know, maybe instead of guys that have been bashing me about it, maybe some guys should say, hey, because of some few people like Mark Merrill that stood up, maybe some guys' lives have been saved because of this. You know, and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. It's just something I, I felt needed to be said and done. I did it. Um, and, you know, obviously I have no relationship with, with WWE now. Um, it's sad because I have the top school program in the country. How cool would it be to be partnered with WWE, saving and changing lives all over the country? You know, having that machine behind you. Imagine how many more lives we, we save. I mean, they have, uh, I think it's called the Be A Star program. But if you really look at what it is, it's you get a couple of wrestlers that come out and the kids go crazy because they see a wrestler without TV. But when they walk out of there, it's not like their, their life has been changed. You walk out of my presentation, we get, we get about 100 letters a day on how the presentation changed or saved somebody's life. There are so many kids going through depression, anxiety, isolation, loneliness, um, self-harm, suicidal thoughts more than ever before. And this is why it's so important that we need programs that um, let kids know they're not alone, they matter, and, and the greatest thing they could do is open up and talk to somebody about it. Well, just knowing how WWE operates, some of it could be that Brock Lesnar is one of their top stars, and of course he's married to your ex, and they might not want to rock the boat by being associated with you, even though, as you said, that could be a great thing, but... That might have something to do with it. I don't know. You know, whatever but, the reason is, there's, there's, there's lives that can be changed or saved, and that should be first and foremost that we can make a difference. Uh, I have no beef with Brock or Triple H or anybody in that organization, you know, but how cool would it be to work together to make a difference? In this? And, and not only that, I mean, I'm in front of, you know, I'm talking about 250 events a year. I'm in front of thousands and thousands of students, Imagine having a, a WWE banner up or something or, you know, it, it do nothing but, but promote their product. And I've seen you on a few of those uh, episodes you did regarding Benoit with superstar Billy Graham, who I've done a bunch of interviews with. I know you've purchased some of his artwork. I know you helped him out last year when he needed uh, medical funding. Could you talk about him a little bit? First of all, I, Billy Graham, I didn't purchase his, his artwork. He sent that to me as a gift. That guy, he came, to my, he came to my office, and we had a great meeting. And next thing I know, um, a few months later, there was a big package in front of my door that he painted this beautiful, beautiful painting for me. It's, it's hanging in my living room right now. And he put a, a banner on it to thank me for all the work I've done with students. But, um, yeah, he's an amazing artist. Um, really like Billy Graham. I mean, you know, he, he has his own thoughts on, on the business, and he's very adamant about how he feels. And you got to respect the guy for the way he feels. I mean, we, I'm, I may not agree on some of the things he says, but, but as a person, man, I, I love the guy. He's a great guy. And did you ever try to go back to WCW after your WWE run ended? Um, you know, it was, it, there were some feelers out, you know, we went, um, me and my ex showed up at one of their events as, um, but, uh, it, it just wasn't in the cards, you know, I remember some, I'm at that point, I'm, I'm 40 years old, you know, my, I've had a lot of surgeries, um, a lot of joint problems, you know, uh, elbows, shoulders, total reconstruction of my knee. So was it really now? I mean, that's incredible the shape I'm in now. It's it's amazing. I can go back to wrestling now. <laughs> not that I want to. <laughs> Definitely not want to. Um, I enjoy what I do so much now. I never would want to. I can't even think of being hurt, not being able to do what I do now. So I wouldn't even take that chance. 
Everyone wanted me to ask you, who would you have a retirement match with? You never actually had a retirement match. If you could choose anybody. Um, hmm, that's a really good question. If I had to wrestle, and, and I, I would pick someone I never wrestled before, um, and it would be probably, probably Shawn Michaels. I tag team with him before, and he's just a, he's just a super talent, you know. But if I had to say someone I never wrestled before, I never wrestled him, you know, w with him as a tag team, but never um, against him. So I would maybe uh, maybe Shawn Michaels would be a good one. And when you visited Vince's house, uh, another fan question, they wanted to know what was his house like and his courting of you. <laughs> oh, he was so good. I mean, a beautiful home in, in, in Connecticut. Um, uh, it was the first time I got to meet Linda and the, and the family. And uh, uh, we had a nice dinner together. And uh, he was just really kind. And uh, just, he really pursued me. I mean, I, I really think, and for some reasons, I, I think they thought they could get the the Johnny B. Bad character or something similar. And, uh, of course, at that time, the war with WCW was so strong that they didn't want to take a chance of having any mannerisms or similarities to the Johnny B. Bad character. So I had to go from, you know, I'm um, so outrageous is contagious to I'm a wild man. <laughs> your, your music was also a lot better in WCW. I'm sure you might agree with that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the, uh, I think Michael Hayes was partly responsible for writing that song. He was a pretty talented guy, too, as far is as... It, is he one of the agents that you liked working with, uh, Michael Hayes? I never worked with Michael Hayes as an agent. Okay. Uh, yeah. He was never an agent when I was there. Was there any uh, WWE agents? I know it's a lot less hands-on than it is now, where they basically plan out your whole match, but... I'm sure there was agents assigned to matches back then. Yeah, I, I oh god, what was the one guy's name that was? Um, I think it was like a tag team partner with a uh, Blackjack Mulligan. Now uh, was it? Uh, oh, Jack Lanza. Uh, Jack Lanza was one of the agents that was always there, and he was a good guy, man. You know, it, it was the road was tough. I mean, uh, whoever it is, agents, referees, wrestlers, the the road is tough. It, it takes its toll on you. And you mentioned you probably would have done better against Butterbean than Bart Gunn did because you're more of a skilled boxer. That was your background. You also had a feud with Butterbean. Yeah. How was that? <laughs> um, I mean, the match went as good as could be expected. I mean, you know, here you got this real tough boxer and we're doing a, 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 a gimmick match. Um, the, the funny thing that happened in that match was there was two stools underneath the ring. One stool was after each round, you would sit, on, I would sit on that stool. And then the other stool was a gimmick stool that would just shatter into a million pieces once you hit him over the back. When I, the finish was, I'm going to hit him over the back with a stool. Well, the, uh, the, the, the trainer that was with me uh, handed me the wrong stool, handed me the, the real stool. And so when I just, I'm thinking this thing's going to shatter all over the place, you know, and I hit him. And it doesn't even move. It doesn't even break. And I think, oh, my gosh, I just hit him so hard and the stool didn't even break. And it was hard to hold because I had boxing gloves on, you know. So I thought, I got to do it again, you know. So Butterbean's laying on the ground. And I hit him again and just the top part breaks off. But that was a shoot. That thing was, that, that was a real stool. That's how hard I hit him, you know. And then so that night we go to dinner. And uh, Butterbean says to me, and he was such a sweetheart of a guy, too. A real good, great guy. We're at dinner, and he goes, he goes, wow, he goes, I thought that stool was supposed to break away. That really hurt. <laughs> I go, well, sorry about that. They gave me the wrong stool. And he goes, what? <laughs> it was comical. And last question here. Jim Cornette was uh, working, I think, on the writing team along with Vince Russo back when you were in the WWE. What are your thoughts on both of those guys? They, they have conflicting views, but they were both uh, working at the same time then. Um, you know what? It's total different views on the business. You know, um, I, I looked at, I got along really well with, I, not that I didn't get along with Jim Cornette, but I, I didn't have a lot of interaction with him. Vince Russo, he was kind of like, 
Sable's mentor. Like, like his writing was based around a lot of stuff that she was doing. So I was in a lot of those meetings, you know, discussing it. Cause I was trying to teach her how to wrestle. I mean, she, she never wrestled in her life. The only wrestling, I mean, we never went to a wrestling school. We, we practiced like before the matches that we were in that town and we tried to show her some moves and stuff. And she actually learned, you know, her karana off the top rope, um, the, the, the sable bomb, the, the TKO moves that I would do that she, that I was able to teach her how to do them. So to her credit, man, she's a really good athlete and she learned fairly quickly, but I mean, people just look at her like she was a crappy wrestler, but she never really wrestled, you know? Um, but I, but so Vince Russo and I were very tight when it came to a lot of decision-making and the ideas we had for the, the, the shows. I mean, remember her, remember the painted hands? Um, those yeah. were my hands. I had to draw them out on her, you know? Um, so, you know, those were our, our ideas that we'd come up with. And, but so, but Jim Carnett was never really hands-on with us. Um, he was always behind the scenes more. So do you think Vince Russo is underrated for the people that, that throw him under the bus all the time? I think Vince Russo had a lot of great ideas. I mean, you know, um, I think when you take someone and because he had some really good ideas that when something doesn't go the way maybe they, they envisioned it, he's more blamed for it going wrong than all the things that went right. I mean, we, we uh, remember the Attitude Era was a lot of Vince's writing. And he was very responsible for a lot of that, the cool stuff. But um, uh, I think he gets a, you know, I mean, there's going to be haters no matter what. You know, I, I like Vince. I really do. I, I, I think he's a, a very good person. And he means well. And he really cares about people. I think he just gets, he takes a lot of stuff to heart. And I think he gets hurt a lot by people. And, and, and if I could ever give him any advice is you're not defined by their opinion. He's a great guy. And where can people follow you if they want to look you up on social media or book you for an event? Oh, man, I'm, I'm on Instagram and Twitter. It's just my name, Mark, with Mark with a C, Mark Merrow, M-E-R-O. And then um, our YouTube page, we just had 100,000 subscribers, um, which is the Mark Merrow. And then um, uh, Facebook is just a uh, uh, Mark Merrow page. And um, love to hear from you, from the people that watch your show, man. Um, it's been really good talking with you. You... You have some really good questions, and I, I really enjoyed this this time we're together. Thank you. And I was wondering if you could finish this interview off by uh, by going back to Johnny B. Bad for a second <laughs> and giving us the "I'm a Bad Man." <laughs> okay, here we go. I love the rock and roll. I strut and stroll, and I'm here to drive you out of control. Why? Because I'm a bad man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at the Hannibal TV for instant updates.